Hi, welcome to Denim Denim, the channel where we explore Levi's vintage and denim culture. Now, how could I have a channel so obsessed with the Old West and not do an episode about the Outlaws? This is going to be a fun one. This is the 1886 XX first unofficial 501 episode. I'm proud to announce Den and Denim's first sponsor, Unbleached Apparel in Brooklyn. They're a small new company making solid t-shirts the honest way. I got to sample a couple of t-shirts and they are perfect. The feel is incredibly soft, but still manly. They're made from 100% raw unbleached cotton. No dyes, no chemical whiteners added. There's no side seams because they have a tubular knit construction. I love the natural look. I think it blends great with indigo. One of my favorite details is that they don't make extra waste with those long nylon tags. The info, like the size, is printed right there on the inside. I put one of them through a hot wash and it didn't shrink at all. Plus, the shirts are an unbleached natural color of cotton. They are completely color fast and will never fade. I think we all know faded blue jeans look really cool, but a faded, sweat-stained white t-shirt ain't the way to go. That's why unbleached apparel t-shirts are really stepping up the game. The natural cream off-white color covers up sweat stains while still remaining super bright, wash after wash. Besides plain t-shirts, the company has some original designs and also sells some awesome accessories like hoodies, bandanas, belts, keychains, all made without harsh chemicals in an eco-friendly manner. And their prices are a lot more affordable than other sustainably focused brands. You can pick up a two-pack of t-shirts for under 30 bucks and they deliver worldwide. Plus, let them know that I sent you. Punch in the code DEN and DENIM at checkout. You get 5% off your order, you help support the channel, you get in some awesome t-shirts. It's a win-win-win for everyone. Get yours today at unbleachapparel.com, link in description. Levi's is the story of a man who went to California to strike it rich during the gold rush. And it's a success story. But what about all those 49ers who didn't get rich, but died trying? It's hard to make it in this life. And for every success story, there are hundreds of failures. Some folks trade in their mining equipment and find jobs to pay the rent. Others trade in their gear for some guns, and this is their stories. In our last episode, 1880s Nevadas, we talked about buried treasure. I had been referring to old denim garments, but now I do mean the story of lost gold. AU, the 79th element. Our story begins in 1852, right in the middle of the Great California Gold Rush. A 19-year-old by the name of Henry Plummer sailed from New York to Panama to ride a donkey across the jungle to the Pacific and embark on the ship to San Francisco. If this journey sounds familiar, it was the same path embarked on two years prior by Mr. Strauss. In San Francisco, Mr. Plummer sought work as a baker perhaps making that scrumptious San Francisco sourdough bread. But this is really just to make a few bucks so he could get some mining equipment and head to the hills for his fortune. It turns out mining ain't got as much dough in it as baking. But since Plummer was such a quick gunslinger, it said he could shoot five bullets in three seconds. He was hired as a marshal in Nevada City, California. There, he began having an affair with a married woman. Upon shooting and killing her abusive husband, Plummer would serve time in San Quentin prison. Upon release, he went to the saloon for a gulp of whiskey. An ex-con recognized him as a former lawman and pulled out a knife. Plummer was quicker with his gun. He would repeat this cycle of lawman, then trouble with the law a couple more times. The West Coast wasn't his final stopping grounds. In the 1860s, he went to Montana. While being the sheriff, he was also the leader of a gang who would extort money from many of the local businesses. He buried his stolen loot somewhere in the woods. Vigilantes finally caught up with him, and he was hanged. His treasure remains a mystery. Treasure hunters are still out there in the Montana wild looking for traces of his gold. Tom Bell Hodges went to medical school and began practicing as a physician. But then... He decided to go west, along with the 49ers, and seek gold in them their hills. He, just like a lot of other folks, got suckered on scams and ended up broke. He tried making a living as a doctor, but it wasn't as lucrative as he'd hoped. 
He had a bit of a gambling problem, and crime was just what you did in the Wild West. He was arrested in 1855 for cattle rustling. You know they say, if you can trace your ancestry back four generations in California, then there's a cattle thief somewhere in your family tree. Tom Bell was about as successful a criminal as he was a miner. But he did escape from prison, so props to that. He and his gang became the first outlaws to rob stagecoaches. This was how Wells Fargo and other banks transported the money. It was a wise move to attack in the open land instead of the city. In 1856, they went to rob a stagecoach that was holding a hundred grand in gold. Guns got fired, and a civilian was murdered. A lynch mob sought Doc Bell out and hanged him. Doc Tom Bell Hodges was the first outlaw to organize a stagecoach robbery. Rattlesnake Dick Barter moved from Canada to San Francisco. He joined a gang after failing during the gold rush and ended up becoming a successful stagecoach robber. The whole time as an outlaw, he kept correspondence with his church-going sister in Canada. She kept convincing him to come home and go straight. And this was a notion he wanted to support and commit to. However, he is considered the most unlucky outlaw of the Old West for a reason. On July 11, 1859, Rattlesnake Dick was met in Placer County by the sheriff. When confronted, Rattlesnake Dick drew his gun and killed the deputy. He refused to return to go to jail. And rather than the law catching up to him, he shot himself in the head. He kept a note in his pocket. Rattlesnake Dick dies but never surrenders. His buried gold is somewhere in the Trinity Mountains of California. It would be worth half a million dollars today. When California joined the Union in 1846, it was explicitly stated that all those of Mexican descent in the new state would be given the same citizenship and rights as white settlers. This was far from the reality. The banditos that rose up were seen as folk heroes trying to retake their land. One of these such stories is of the Flores Daniel Gang. A group of over 50 men from San Luis Obispo to San Juan Capistrano who stole cattle and robbed from wealthy settlers, aka gringos. Their uprising started to gain steam, almost turning into a full-fledged revolution. However, the powers that be, including the Los Angeles sheriffs and even well-to-do Californios, such as the Pico family and other Dones, took notice and looked for enough public support to turn on the gang. In 1857, the gang killed two store merchants and a police officer in Los Angeles. Some scholars believe that the cop was actually murdered because he was in a love triangle with a woman who was also having an affair with Flores. This was known as the Barton Massacre, and it turned into a full-on manhunt. Both Flores and Daniel made an epic last stand in San Juan Capistrano. In the aftermath, over a hundred men were rounded up and sentenced to death, despite there being only 50 members in the gang. It took the entirety of the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, plus the help of the Doan's private gangs, such as the El Monte Boys, and additional lynch mobs to take down Las Manias. Here's the story of a man who has been portrayed on film more times than all the others on this list combined. Of course, I'm talking about Joaquin Muyeta, the Robin Hood of the Old West, the real-life Zorro. He actually began his career as a successful California gold miner, but after Gringos killed his wife and brother, he would claim his revenge one by one on these scum. Yet, there still was so much injustice towards the Californios from Gringos. Aided by those who also lost family members, they formed a gang, robbed from the rich, and gave to the poor. The U.S. Army created the Rangers specifically to bring this man to justice. And eventually did. Or so we think. The general in charge beheaded Murieta and charged people a dollar to see his head in a jar. But it's Hollywood that would have the last laugh, and such an icon could never be killed. With over 40 film adaptations, 10 plus TV series, including a new one on Amazon coming out this month called La Cabeza de Joaquin Murieta, The Legend of Zorro is one of California's first superheroes and cultural icons. In 2021, Fresno County, California officially recognized Joaquin Murieta as a legendary hero with a parade and fair. Hell, the guy even has his own beer. Oh, wait a minute. La cerveza, la cabeza. I love puns. There were 14 Dalton brothers. A few of them were lawmen. But after an accidental murder, their reputation was tarnished, and the brothers formed a gang known to history as the Wild Bunch. 
They became one of the most successful gangs in the Wild West and knew that their reputation was everything. So, in 1892, in Coffeyville, Kansas, they decided to show the world their full potential by robbing two banks at the same street corner simultaneously. By the end of the day, only Emmett would survive. This happened in Kansas, so what does it have to do with our channel? Well, it is rumored that the Dalton gang were the first outlaws to die wearing a pair of Levi's jeans. There are pictures of them soon after dying, and several reporters and spectators ripped pieces of their garments as souvenirs. At first, I thought I spotted rivets. I hate to say it, but they look like trousers. Still, I like the story and inspired this episode, so just go with it for a moment. Grat Dalton spent some time in California in the late 1880s. He would have come in contact with Levi's jeans and possibly did own a pair. The jeans we call 1890s didn't really come into existence until 1893, so the pairs they would have worn most likely would have been circa 1886 style. Now this gets me thinking about the logistics of wearing denim while committing crimes in the Old West. It's not a good idea. You see, a pair of rigid is uniform in color, but leaves indigo stains on everything it roughly touches. Plus, the stiffness is just impractical for easy maneuvering. Worn in pairs of jeans, they'll give you a strong yet flexible material to wear, but will have unique distression markings that could be used to identify you. Therefore, those who wear denim are honest souls and innocent of any crimes levied forth. I've got one last outlaw to mention before we go. I really love giving you a solid film recommendation. And the film The Wild Bunch 1969 is not about the Dalton gang, but it's a decent flick with Ernest Bornine. Gotta love that smile. I used clips from a 2022 release of the Dalton gang. You can watch it here on YouTube. But it feels more like a fan-made flick. You gotta be really into the subject matter to want to watch it all the way through. I do recommend Harry Tracy, The Last of the Wild Bunch, a.k.a. Desperado, 1982, starring Bruce Dern and Gordon Lightfoot. Mm-mm. One thing I can definitely say about Bruce Dern, he's the type of actor, he doesn't want you to like him. He doesn't want you to like his character. He's really clear about that. Bruce Dern established himself as the movie's premier heavy, playing sociopaths, psychotics, and just plain criminals. How did you feel about that? Uh, <laughs> Which makes me like his acting that much more. And uh, Gordon Lightfoot, oh man. If you're interested in some soulful 70s music, you gotta put on some Gordon Lightfoot. Harry Tracy is known as the last of the outlaws, and with his death in 1902, the days of the Wild West officially came to an end. It's the dichotomy of these characters. Lawman and outlaw, lover and loner that are easily romanticized in this fictitious history, but there's still so much truth in it that is beyond what Hollywood will ever actually produce. It's great that we can come in contact with them, and as someone from California who's always been criticized as not having culture, this is part of our culture. People in Scandinavia have Vikings, and they're bad dudes, but there's still a truth to it. There's still a romanticized view and a realistic view. And it's combining both of these and these elements as we learn about it throughout history, throughout our own history, how they inspire us, how they repulse us, that makes great storytelling. Now, just like many of the other 19th century pairs, there are two distinct versions of the 1886 jeans. The older made versions are less historically accurate, the later versions are more accurate and fit the details of other 1880s models. Historically accurate 1886 jeans would have had the duck and denim patch and possibly shank buttons or possibly sewn on buttons. We are uncertain whether the patch was in the middle or on the right side. Again, we make a return to Bodie, California and an 1886 Nevada pair of early 501s. These came out in 2013. They seem to have mostly historically accurate details. Then there's a Barnstormer 1886. Barnstormer has been used for a few different jeans, and it could just mean it was found in a barn or it is made to look as if it were worn in a rodeo circuit. Something 
distressed in the way that riding a horse would do to you. Best version I think I've seen of all of these are the California Race Association from spring summer 2005. It's said that it's a recreation of the oldest 501 in the vault. However, we do have the 1879 that predates that. It's still a double X. This would have been closer to what we're calling a 501. Now there are the historically inaccurate versions for 125th anniversary. Those will have a two horse patch and shank buttons. I'm not too interested in talking too much about them, mostly focusing on the historically accurate ones that I can find. One of the versions comes with the gunpowder bag, also seen on the gingham triple pleat blouse. 1886 was a special year for the Levi's company, and they like to celebrate it with these jeans. What makes this year so special? Well, 1886 is the year they started using the Two Horse logo. Levi's also uses the moniker the Two Horse brand. And this symbol first appeared on the pocket bag. Within the decade, it would be seen on the patch and in advertisements. The lot numbers refer to each style of garment. It is in 1886 that the lot number 501 was first issued. This would have been an internal numbering system that only the Levi Strauss company and possibly the retailers would have known about. It's not until the 1890s that the company starts printing the lot numbers on the items. It's also in 1886 that the Levi Strauss company baseball team was formed. Thank you to my Patreon peeps. Get in on all the fun, support the channel. There's extra videos, early releases. Starts at a buck a month. I'm Den. Thanks for watching Den and Denim. Love your jeans.